Okay, so before we start, um, who doesn't know what voice over IP is? Excellent. Anybody not know what fuzzing is? Excellent. <laughs> yes, I forgot to shave. Thank you. Uh, fuck off. Okay, the mouse cursor is staying. Um, all right, so we're going to start off with a bit of background info on voice over IP, uh, previous research into voice over IP security. Uh, then I'm going to do an introduction to Viper, um, description of some of its features, a couple of demos, assuming I can actually see with the screen resolution, um, some results, then Q&A. Um, all right, so about me, I'm from Ireland, uh, just finished a Bachelor of Science, about to start a Master's, yeah. and that's my site if you want to check it out. Okay, so I'm pretty sure everybody knows this, but just to make sure we're all kind of on the same playing field, uh, voice over IP, routing voice data over the IP network, pretty obvious. Uh, you can use it in tandem with a traditional phone network, um, or you can just use voice over IP on its own. Um, there's a lot of companies that we're all familiar with involved in it, so Cisco, Nortel, Levaya, and a lot of smaller ones. Um, and there's loads of different devices involved. You have proxies, registrars, gateways, phones, um, loads of crap. Okay, so voice over IP, um, it's getting more and more popular, apparently, according to computer economics, if they're to be believed. Uh, about 50% of large businesses are using it in some form in 2008. So, you know, it's becoming a much more popular target. Um, so why is it so popular? Pretty obvious. Um, apparently, you can get a 20% reduction in costs after uh, you've paid for all the devices in crack. Um, you get location independence, and you get a bit of independence from the telcos as well. Okay, so the protocols involved, um, there's a lot of them, basically. Um, the reason I'm just showing this is because really automated testing with all these protocols, you know, you don't want to be getting, like, say, if you have all these protocols and then you have all these devices that implement all these protocols, manually auditing them, not fun. Okay, so Viper, um, I concentrated on SIP and SDP um, to begin with and then moved into... Um, IAX and H1323. So just uh, to make sure we're all on kind of the same level here. Uh, SIP, sponsored by the ITF. Uh, it's an open standard. It looks a little bit like HTTP, um, kind of. Um, it's human readable. And SIP itself is used for uh, command control. So basically initializing the session and then other protocols take care of um, handling data transfer and that kind of stuff. Um, SDP is carried as the content inside a SIP. Um, it's used for negotiating the codex uh, for audio, video, um, and it's been extended for fax over IP. Again, it's human readable. And uh, in combination with SIP, you know, you can use it, both of these for um, a lot of stuff, not just voice over IP. Um, it's been used for instant messaging and a few more different things. Um, okay. So this is what a typical SIP SDP request looks like. Um, human readable, as I said. So the top part there is the SIP part, and after the line break, uh, it's the SDP part. Okay, so then just H1323 quickly. Um, it's ITU sponsored. Um, it's the, pretty much the dominant protocol um, in backbone voice networks and kind of large enterprise deployments like, say, call centers, um, that kind of stuff. Um, it's an umbrella recommendation, basically, so it includes lots of other um, specifications for you know, everything from security to registration, admission status, that kind of stuff. Um, so unlike SIP, uh, H.233 can specify an entire uh, voice over IP deployment. Okay, so voice over IP really, um, it's, uh, it really is a, a good thing for hackers. I mean, it's taking your voice network and you're moving it into an environment where we have all the tools that we've been using for years. It's the same transform protocols like TCP IP, um, same environments. Um, the standards are much easier to get um, to get a hold of than, say, um, most other um, telephony standards. And the devices themselves, like you can just go and download a lot of the more popular um, uh, voice over IP devices or trials for them, that kind of stuff. You can test them. And most of the stuff I found in the trial software is um, in the regular, say, professional software as well. Um, so thanks for that. Uh, so this is something that I kind of came across at the start when I started the product or started the um, the testing. Uh, a lot of people kind of just saying, oh, 
okay, so what can you really do with a voice over IP phone? Maybe you're going to be able to knock it over. Uh, that's maybe it. But these devices, like they're running um, really complex operating systems. Um, they have like full TCP IP stacks. They're running like web servers, uh, TFTVD clients, um, loads of cool stuff that um, really, if you had a standard phone sitting on your desk, you're not really going to have to worry about. Um, so a few possible kind of attack scenarios. So um, kind of the standard stuff. Um, those targeted sea level attacks or whatever is something that um, some Russian group were doing a while ago with um, basically just getting uh, addresses, contact details of high-level people and then specifically targeting them, kind of like spear phishing, basically. Or, you know, if you get salespeople ringing you and they're like, yeah, I'll call you back, and then just knock over their phone. Um, so there's two kind of, well, I suppose this is one way of looking at it, two possible viewpoints on looking at uh, previous voice over IP security research. Um, attacking the kind of the design of it, so you know the authentication, um, authorization, encryption, that kind of stuff. Um, and there's been a load of research done on that for quite some time. Um, and then attacking the protocol implementation, like the actual device themselves. So you're going for code execution or denial of service if you can't get that. Um, and there's been a good bit of research in that area as well. Um, so attacking the design, pretty much, it's almost identical in terms of methodology to every other. Um, kind of TCP IP protocol um, attack in that. Uh, so you have enumeration, scanning, cracking accounts, man the middle attacks. Um, and the threats are they're pretty, you know, they're easy enough to manage in the same way as, you know, anything else. Um, so you can do this with pretty much any tool. So you can use like Nmap, um, just scan for open SIP ports, H three two two three ports, anything like that. Then just write a you know, you can use um, tools like SIP Vicious then to crack accounts, like that is really, really good. You can like scan like 50 or 70 um, accounts a second or something. Um, you can also map the networks. Um, you've got Voice Hopper then, which is pretty cool. Um, it's for, say, some com like hotels and things like that. They'll use a VLAN to segregate, um, say, their phones from their data network, and that's a really great idea. Um, and Voice Hopper takes care of that, or VoIP Hopper even. Um, so then attacking the implementation is pretty much what um, Viper is about. Um, so it's basically, it's, it's fuzzing the devices, but attempting to do it in like a completely automated way. So the point of Viper basically is, you know, you start it and you go away and you, you come back and you have a list of um, bugs that, and it can reproduce them for you. So there's a couple of tools that have done stuff like this. So Protos, um, their SIP suite was probably the first one. Um, it pretty much it just tested the invite request, um, but it was really good. It pretty much killed everything when it came out. But nowadays, um, it's kind of it's kind of old. Um, it also it does kind of pretty rudimentary crash detection. So after every request, it sends a valid request. If it doesn't get the response it expects, it tells you it died. Um, okay, KIF is something from a research group in France, I think. Um, and they've posted uh, loads and loads and loads of vulnerabilities to uh, bug track. Um, and until a couple of months ago, it wasn't available. Uh, but now it is. If you send them an email, and then they send you a contract, and then you print the contract, and sign the contract, and post back the contract, and then they don't send you the software. Um, <laughs> so that's fun. Um, and then Interstate. Um, was presented last year. What that does, it, um, instead of fuzzing like headers like you normally would, it fuzzes um, so the state of the protocol. So it tries to put the device into a into a known state, and then it sends um, kind of unexpected but valid requests to try and um, knock it into an invalid state. Uh, the guys from KIF did something like that, and they actually uh, they were able to put a phone into a state where they'd send a request, but then they'd send another one straight after it. And instead of the phone ringing, it'd go into um, basically an eavesdropping mode. It'd start listening in the room without ever ringing. So uh, that was kind of cool. Um, and then you've got Code, Namakan, um, U Dynamics, and that kind of stuff. And those, their tools are really good, um, but they're really expensive as well. Um, so we, all of these, they're pretty much they're pretty successful at finding bugs and voice over IP implementations. Uh, but there's a few uh, drawbacks to all of them. Um, and those are them. It's pretty much uh, either they're difficult to acquire or they're expensive. Um, Say so things like Protos are quite hard to extend because you don't really you don't get a fuzzer. You get a collection of tests basically. Um, 
and then the thing I really wanted to concentrate on, Viper, was I really wanted full automation. I didn't want to have to, you know, sit there and wait for it to crash and then restart the device and then wait for it to crash because some of these devices are like, oh, you'll see the results. Um, so Viper, basically, just a quick overview, just cross-platform. Um, at the moment, uh, there's like, I don't know, 10 different fuzzers for SIP and SDP in it. Um, I've extended it to cover um, IAX as well, but I haven't released that because um, it's not quite stable. Um, and I'm hoping to work on a few more protocols. Um, okay, there's, on top of the fuzzers then, you've, um, there's a lot of logging, kind of target management, uh, crash recreation. And the name of the game really is full automation. Um, so the fuzzers themselves, there's about 10 of them. Um, and that number is an underestimate there. There's probably, there's maybe 50,000 requests in each, each fuzzer. Um, and it's kind of a case of all the knowledge is kind of encapsulated in the fuzzer. So you just basically run the command line tool or the GUI client, start it up, uh, and then go away. Um, the, I use Sully um, as the fuzzing framework behind it, so that's really cool. It provides um, kind of like debuggers and crash detection and that kind of stuff. Um, and it does provide, um, obviously, enough a way to get your fuzz request from your fuzzer as far as the uh, the target. But really, for what I wanted, I wanted kind of a to be able to interact with the client um, and the servers in kind of a say a stateful protocol aware way. So I ended up basically writing um, a pretty rudimentary SIP uh, core kind of SIP client to deliver the requests. Um, the fuzzers, they pretty much look like um, what you expect from Spike um, or Sully or that kind of thing. Um, so that's pretty, that's an example of one there, the content length. Um, that example header there causes a professional level business grade, really great phone uh, to crash. Um, so the SIP core itself then is just basically, it's a, it's a SIP library. Um, what it does is, here, there's this kind of a standard kind of SIP interaction. Um, you're sending an invite, then you're sending, you're waiting for a response, then you decide you don't want to call them anymore, so you send a cancel. You wait for those responses, and then an ACK is sent. Now, Protos um, can fuzz the first invite, um, and so can many other tools, but with, um, with Viper, basically, you can set, fuzz the first invite, um, and then you can map out the protocol in such a way that you know that when a 180 ring um, arrives, you just send a cancel then you wait for those two responses, and then you fuzz the ACK. So you can fuzz, um, theoretically, the whole, um, the whole state space of SIP. Um, and I thought that was a really good idea at first, but it's not. Um, and it took a long time. Uh, so this is, what, um, this is what kind of the protocol mapping would look like. Um, it's kind of a bit cryptic at first, but once you kind of get a hang on it, um, it's pretty easy to define any kind of tests, really. So you're sending a valid invite. Um, then you're waiting for a, a 1xx response, sending a valid cancel, waiting for a 2xx response, which you just ignore. And then when you get a 4xx response, you fuzz the ACK. Um, and you can do this to define kind of pretty much any type of um, interaction you want. You could send like 10 correct um, invites and then say a few ACKs if you wanted to fuzz the state of the protocol, uh, kind of like interstate or KIF. Um, so the crash detection, uh, this is really important for um, if you want full automation, like fuzzing, when it first came around, everyone was like, hey, automated crashes and that kind of stuff. But that isn't really very good if, you know, you cause one crash right at the start, and then you, you know, you can't, um, you can't automatically restart the target. Uh, so there's two types provided. Um, Protocol-based crash detection, um, basically what that does is uh, similar to uh, Protos. It sends your fuzz request, and after every fuzz request, it sends um, something that should elicit a response. Um, and if it doesn't, then it's probably crashed. Or sorry, that's protocol based. And then process based is basically using the um, uh, using uh, what comes with Sully and some stuff I wrote to uh, you attach to the process. Um, and then when an exception is um, detected, you obviously report report that it's crashed. That's a lot more reliable than protocol based. Um, but it only works if a debugger script has been worked or written for the for the system you're running the SIP client on. So at the moment, there is support for Windows and Linux um, and OS X. But uh, if you're testing like a hard phone, uh, you're going to have to stick with protocol base for the time being. Um, and with that, you get pretty detailed reporting of the crashes. Um, so it still uses a PyDVD to attach. So you get like uh, all the registers at the time. You get a kind of a 
uh, some areas on the stack that might be interesting, that kind of stuff reported. Um, target management uh, is basically taking the output from the uh, crash detection, and once a crash has been detected, it reports it, logs it, and then it restarts the device. Um, basically, this allows you to, as we were saying, you start the fuzzer, you go away, you don't have to interact with it anymore, uh, you come back to a list of files that caused the crash, a list of reports, um, and you can work from there. Um, this is really useful for a lot of the, um, the open source SIP clients. Uh, they've got a lot of denial of service problems, so they'll fall over a lot, um, but it's not particularly interesting, so kind of null pointer to references that are kind of tricky to do anything with and that kind of stuff. Um, and as I said, for this, you need a script running on the target device, so if you're running a hard phone or you're testing a hard phone, then this isn't going to be possible. Um, and crash recreation, this is basically um, once the crash has been detected, enough information is logged about that crash that you can come along afterwards and recreate it. And there's a script provided that will, um, say, take any file that caused a crash and turn it into kind of a standalone proof of concept. Um, so that's pretty handy. Um, okay, demo time. So this, um, what's it? This works? Oh. Yes, it does. OK, uh, this is kind of a, it's a software um, PBX, basically. Um, you should make note of the company. We'll be coming across them again in a few minutes. It's made by a company called NCH. Um, they make really good software. Uh, so basically, this is the process monitor. Um, you just specify, uh, say, a crash file, the process to attach to, and this timeout is if a crash occurs, it'll wait that amount of time before telling the fuzzer you can keep fuzzing. Because um, a lot of these devices, they can take um, like 10, 15 seconds before they're in a state to be tested again. Um, so we start that. Okay. Jesus. Can everyone see that? Um, what we're specifying here is uh, those are all the fuzzers that are available um, in the current version. There is um, there's a GUI for um, for Windows that is probably going to crash and burn. Um, yeah, I wouldn't recommend using this on anything that isn't Windows because uh, I suck at GUI coding. Um, okay, so on the command line, you specify the uh, dash i is the target, um, dash p is the port. Uh, there's three levels of crash detection. So um, level three is basically it uses the process-based um, uh, script to attach. Then this is um, the path to the um, the target we're testing. So that'll be used to restart it. And then this is where we're going to store um, any crash information. So start that. Jump over here. Kill that. <laughs> okay, so it's found in it. Okay, that was quick. Um, right, so as you can see, uh, crash was detected straight away there. Um, and that uh, we give it 10 seconds to restart the. Uh, Oh, it's gone way up in the corner, and it's crashed again. Um, so as you can see, uh, if you don't really have uh, automated crash detection and restarting here, you're going to be sitting there for quite some time, you know, clicking stuff and restarting stuff and generally cursing and shouting. Um, is it going to go again? Oh, it's gone again. Uh, so yeah, let's just shut that up. Uh, as you can see back here, um, you just get some output on what happened. 
Uh, and then in this directory, we get uh, all the crash log files. Basically, you can use um, this crash replay tool then to just replay those and um, narrow down the cause of the crash and that kind of stuff. Uh, the cra Um, this is basically what's in those files, so you can see here uh, this rather wonderful device takes our word for the content length, which is nice. Okay, and that's pretty much it. Um, so during the testing, um, I focused on clients because I figured um, servers were, or SIP servers, especially like Asterix and that, were pretty much uh, tested to death. Um, and I hadn't really seen much done on um, kind of the more popular clients. So a key guy is pretty much installed on um, a lot of Ubuntu and, and Debian desktops. Gizmo 5 is pretty popular. Uh, and then Twinkle I basically took because it uses kind of a, an interesting way to parse the requests. And then I took the bottom one because it was pretty much the first thing you get when you Google for a Windows, um, what was it, SIP business phone or something. Uh, so these are the results of the testing. Uh, these crashes basically are organized, um, say, by the number of crashes, and then each bar is broken down into the, the actual fuzzer that caused the crash. When I actually ran these tests, I only had uh, the five fuzzers. But um, the interesting thing about this is that the, uh, the variation in the crashes uh, in terms of the fuzzer is very small. So as you can see, the purple and the blue make up the vast majority of the crashes. Um, and when I started out t writing Viper, um, I thought, okay, to find the crashes, I'm going to have to test, you know, the most obscure features. Uh, so I sat down, I went through the whole RFC, and I took out like this 40-something different um, lines. And I thought, okay, these are going to, f these are going to be the ones that are going to find the, you know, the crashes. And it turns out, pretty much, either they're not implemented, um, or they're implemented to such a level that they could never actually, you know, cause any serious damage because they're just, they basically just say, oh, I'm not here. Um, so all the crashes were from the really common kind of SIP, he or SIP headers, or the vast majority of them were anyway. Uh, so you might notice that um, one client is missing from there. That's the NCH uh, business talk. Um, and there it is, in all its glory. Uh, it crashed several hundred times, um, which was nice. Oh, and they don't respond to emails when you tell them that kind of stuff. And neither did the gizmo guys. They just close your ticket. <laughs> but a key and twinkle are really good. Um, so, what time is it? Anyone? Twenty-one past. I talk too fast. Um, so the testing conclusions. Uh, basically, everything crashed. Everything I came across crashed. Um, every single device. Um, had a, cra had a crash in it that could be caused by a single packet. So basically the, the user doesn't even need to answer the phone. Um, they can just be, as long as the phone's enabled, um, then it can be crashed or you can get code execution. Uh, the vast majority of the bugs were um, null pointer to references, but um, everything except for Twinkle had um, memory corruption, exploitable memory corruption issues. Um, and yeah, NCH, don't use them for anything, don't go near them, you know, just stay away, bad, bad, bad. Um, so, during uh, or coming to the end of development of Viper, um, I'd realized I'd spent you know many many hours on it, and the reason for that really is because I decided to write a generational fuzzer, uh, which means you do, you map out the whole protocol in something similar to um, like Spike or Sully or Peach or something like that, and it takes really like it takes absolute ages to do that, uh, especially if you wanted to do it to the level I did. Um, so kind of, I wonder how many of the bugs I found I would have actually found if I'd just gone with a mutational fuzzer. Um, I did kind of uh, some quick testing. I wrote a quick mutational fuzzer for IAX2, um, and it crashed lib IAX in about 23 seconds or something. So maybe I won't go down the route of a generational fuzzer for that. Um, and I also thought that uh, I'd cover the whole RFC because I figured, you know, if I want to find some bugs, I'm going to have to find a part of the protocol that hasn't been tested before. Um, and really, that's what took the most amount of time, and it, it returned um, virtually no bugs at all. And for the most uh, kind of for the obscure cases and the corner cases, um, so the vast majority of classes were, or crashes even were in the common fields. Um, 
so the good, really, um, once you start the Viper, uh, unless there's something really weird going on, you can just start it and go away and come back to a list of crashes. Um, and it works with any uh, SIP SDP compliant device. Uh, you just start it up um, and bugger off. Uh, I gave it to a guy um, who works for a company that I can't name. Um, and he basically, he started up against their internal stuff, um, came back to, I don't know, like 20, 30 different crashes. He didn't need to know how it worked. He didn't need to know how SIP or SDP worked or anything like that. So that's pretty cool. Um, and it's all open source as well. So um, anybody can basically take and do what they want with it. Um, the version that's on SourceForge at the moment is kind of old. Um, and I was going to upload the, um, the new version this week. But I'm afraid of the network. Um, Okay, so the first guy there, he took it and like he uh, basically he tested it to death, found a load of bugs. Um, anybody else I want to thank uh, who helped out with the beta testing? There's a lot of people, and then uh, those two networks there, those guys there that donated a lot of stuff, uh, like time and hardware and that kind of stuff. Um, so that's pretty much the end of it. Uh, I kind of rushed through it, so I'm sorry about that. But uh, those links there, the first one's my site, the second one is the wiki for this, so there's a lot of tutorials and there's a video demo and that kind of stuff there. And the bottom one, um, you can actually go and get the the code. Um, it should be up. I'm not home for another week, so give it a week, and the new version will be up. Um, so, questions? Uh, so the question is: Have I tested against any of the SIP simple implementations? Uh, no. There's the answer to that. Uh, I would, or sorry, okay, the question, have I any plans to support Cisco Skinny? Is that it? Uh, I would if someone would give me the hardware to play with. So if anybody wants to give me the hardware to play with, then I will. Ah, oh, thanks. Have you tested against any uh, border control type of things like the OpenSBC? Uh, so the question is, have I tested against any border control type things? Uh, no. Uh, Um, I haven't, but the um, the first guy I tanked there has, and he said he found um, problems in some implementations. Uh, I can't give the names of the companies, obviously. But uh, anyways, um, Skype wouldn't really be a bundle of fun to try and test because uh, of, say, it's the protocol itself is encrypted. Um, I think somebody did a talk at Black Hat two years ago about that, and that's a world of pain. I don't really want to get into. Uh, no, I didn't. I wasn't aware of that. So. Nope. Okay, I think that's it. Thanks very much, guys.